AC-13, PC-14, Engine-29, Engine-21, Rescue-21, Medic-21, Engine-28, Engine-22, Truck-23, Structure Fire, District-29, 5920, Hoffman Lane, PC-13, PC-14, Engine-29, Engine-21, Rescue-21, Medic-21, Engine-28, Engine-22, Truck-23, Operations A-7. I don't remember the date, but summertime, uh, hot afternoon, about not quite 100, but in, into the 90s, so it's warm out. Uh, we had just gotten back from a medical aid and had just been driving on Greenback, and there was no smoke in the air, nothing that let us know there was a fire, but we got back, just sat down, and, and we got tapped out. As soon as we pulled onto the ramp, you could see a column. So we knew we had a working job. Um, Hoffman Lanes, it's in our first inn, and it's, kind of, it's a unique area in our first inn. Big lots, deep setbacks, big custom homes. Um, a lot of times you don't know exactly what you're going to. They have small 1,000 square foot homes on a huge lot, and they have 4,000 square foot homes. Single story, double story, they're all, they're all, uh, they're all custom, so you don't know what you're getting into. As we pulled up, there, there were a ton of people in the street, neighbors out. Coming up the driveway, they had a double driveway with gates across both sides. So one of the gates was open, so Tim pulled past and backed in, which wound up being a really good decision. It gave us access to, to the back side of the rig because the setback of the house from the driveway was about 100 feet. It looked like a two-story house with a garage on the right side, as you're looking at it, what looked like a bedroom above it, a single-story wing of the house off to the left, and then there was a door kind of in the middle. And we had fire showing from that door and in the bedroom upstairs and a big column from, from the Charlie side of the house. It is responding to Hoffman, engine 29 is on scene. We've got a two-story house. Uh, looks like heavy smoke and heavy fire from the alpha side. Engine 29 is initiating fire attack. Second in engine will need a water supply intake, man. Giant 13 copies, 29 is on scene. Heavy fire from the alpha side, two-story. Next thing, get a water supply and come in. Uh, it's still split. Okay. Units responding into 29. Uh, Witnesses are saying garage fire extended into the house. Report is all the occupants are out and there are compressed cylinders popping off from the garage. Rescue 21's on scene. We're going to split officer to the roof. Engine 29 can initiate fire attack on the garage. Second in engine will need to check the house. It looks like extended into the attic of the house as well. Alright, engine 21 copies from on scene. We're laying in from just down the street of Hoffman. We'll uh, assume command and copy your traffic. Uh, I arrive on rescue 21 as the first due truck just behind first due engine, engine 29. Um, when we arrive, uh, notice a heavy fire involvement in a detached garage kind of on the Charlie Delta aspect of this structure. Um, and we ladder um, the front, Rescue 21 references and says we're going to split. Team 1's going to the roof for vent, hey, sir, Team 2's going inside for search. Our thought was this is probably a garage fire extending into the house. Um, told Dave to pull a line to, to that door thinking it was a door into the garage, which would give us the main seat of the fire. We could start there and then, and then branch off, find our way upstairs and, and work through it that way. Dave did that, I gave my arrival. As I was stepping off the engine, a bystander came up who Sarah, had a, up it was pretty, it was clear pretty quick. He was a retired fireman. He's like, hey, you got a garage fire back on the Charlie Delta corner. The family's out of the garage. Um, there, there have been some small explosions like cans popping off in the garage, but everybody's out. So I was like, perfect. So I passed that on um, on the tag channel as I was walking up the driveway. And then it was clear that it was in the attic of the house as well. There was a gable vent up to the left as you walked through that had smoke coming out. So at that point, my direction to the next engine was like, I had already told me need a water supply take command. And then I made it clear that the next line needs to go into the house. Uh, myself and firefighter Jason Watts make the roof, uh, recognize that it's cow pack, um, and see that we do have heavy fire involvement in what ends up being a Bravo Charlie detached garage. Um, uh, but we're going to make 
offensive heat holes and try to get vent over the actual living space, the house itself, a single story house. So we make the ridge sound. Cowpack has its own challenges. Um, sounding doesn't give you a ton of feedback in, in, uh, with the cowpack metal roof. You're kind of sounding on a trampoline in areas. Um, so we got to read smoke conditions um, and read the roof and what it's telling us. But we, we access a spot, determine a spot for, for cutting a heat hole, uh, and we get our first heat hole. Through that first heat hole, we get real good smoke production, not fire initially. Um, of course, it finally eventually reaches to us and lights off. Um, we make our way towards the Bravo side, put in a second heat hole. Uh, now we've got our strategy a little bit better with the cowpack because cowpack does present some challenges operationally with running the saw and, and peeling the metal to see what uh, the under sheeting is. Uh, but we got a second hole in, big, uh, slightly bigger than the first, and that one becomes even more productive with heavy fire of smoke and eventually heavy fire. As we approached, I made contact with uh, Air Montgomery on the roof, they were cutting, and I asked him if he was good, and he said, no, we need help. So I turned around and grabbed team two and said, change of assignment, you guys make the roof, work with Monty. I put that out on the radio so that command would know that we were splitting up, and then uh, the saw fireman, Chris Neese, and I uh, went inside. There was not a ton of hanging smoke inside. It was kind of, you barely needed a mask on type kind of thing. So to me, that says it's clearly in the attic and looking at the roof and understanding the cow pack that it's moving through uh, the cow pack um, between the layers. So I think about that time it had gotten cleaned up on the radio that it was cow pack and not tile. And so we went to work inside. There was some confusion on the inside. I think really what it came down to is this was a little bit of a house that we're not kind of used to, to working on. This was a, a flat faced traditional ranch style house, but it had been remodeled fairly significantly and uh, it had plaster over chicken wire for its ceiling component. It wasn't drywall. So when we moved into what amounted to the Charlie Delta corner of the house, which was the kitchen area, which was opposite the main body of fire in the exterior, and started throwing hooks into the roof, it became very evident that this, or into the ceiling, it became very evident that this wasn't gonna be so easy. I communicated with, with Chris Neese. He had brought up, uh, well, Team 2 had brought up an A-frame, but we had also brought up chainsaws. He went out, he brought that stuff inside. He started cutting a scuttle to get access. Some of the confusion, I think, was that the hose lines weren't really getting an opportunity to fight fire from the inside because of this ceiling uh, material. So a lot of the hose lines were moving around inside. Guys were moving around inside and they weren't, kind of where they needed to be to put water on the fire when we got it opened. So right about the time Chris was getting the scuttle cut out, the hose line took off. So we're trying to rein them back in. <clears throat> Drop the scuttle, have strong running fire in that section of the house, which amounts to the uh, delta aspect of the house. They get some water on it. I start moving through to the back rooms. Um, the search had been cleared at that point, And so we start looking for alternate access points came back outside and made contact with my guys. They're peeling cow pack, trying to get access, calling for hose lines to the roof. Truck 23 showed up and I showed up there shortly after. I, I didn't do a passover command. I was very engaged in the call already from the get-go on the road, so I was comfortable with what the operation was currently under. Um, so I immediately sent um, 21 with an additional line to the front man door because we started had, having adding involvement at that point. We ended up having I think total of six lines on this, on this house. Three exterior defensive, two interior uh, supporting the attic involvement, significant lateral spread. It was identified early that we're in a life priority, but we were a kind of a combination attack. And it was, it was really looking at the construction, talking to the homeowner who said he had a lot of remodeling done on it. Uh, we called it initially a tile, um, tile roof. He, he, that's, that's what he called it, and then it was um, quantified that it was a cow pack roof. Cow pack over shingles on the main body of the house. Cow pack, new roof construction cow pack over the second floor addition to the garage. And the second floor addition to the garage was kind of a great room, party room area. Quite a few hand lines working on this. The sixth line was, was a request from the truck to get it up to the roof. It ended up being um, you know, pretty stout conventional construction. Um, two by six top cord, two by six bottom cord um, on, the, on the main body of the house. We started to have an air conditioner slough in. 
Um, I noticed uh, after I showed up, I had a command officer. I, I reached out and asked who that was. It was B-14. I asked him for a lap because I didn't have good intel or good eyes on what was going around on the Charlie side. And that's where we still had significant fire and heat production. Truck 23, command, are you still on the roof or are you down yet? I'm still up there just taking care of hot spots. My guys are down. Okay, as soon as you get down, can you give me a good report from the interior on bottom cord of everything that we got exposed, please? Hey, firm, it'll be a minute. Yeah, no worries. I'm just uh, worried about burn time and us working inside. I just want to make sure we got good bottom cord left. Command truck 23, priority. Go ahead with priority traffic. We have a significant change in the overall roof structure directly over the main entrance to the house. It's dipped down about a foot in the past minute. That would be in line with the HVAC on the opposite side. I recommend we shut down the front door's access. Yeah, there was a, a big HVAC unit, which happened to be on the uh, Charlie aspect of the single story house portion. And it was essentially kind of dead center of the single story part of the house. Uh, you walk in uh, the front door and is essentially over that breezeway, uh, slightly over to the Bravo side of the breezeway. Um, initially, it was, it was holding pretty good. Obviously, that's something that we read on the roof. Uh, there wasn't crews underneath it at that point. I didn't really give a, radio, a roof report early that that was there, but there was nobody underneath me initially either. Later in the incident, once we had, I mean, we had obviously a big distraction in the garage portion and heavy fire in the attic portion. Um, once our heat holes, which the, the bigger of the two heat holes was on the alpha side, kind of opposing the HVAC unit. Um, we had heavy fire coming out of that, which didn't help the, the weight that the HVAC brought to the roof structure. So it began to settle a little bit, which later in the incident, great communication was had from command uh, and truck 23 and I on how we're gonna attack that and how we may or may not work in or around it. Chief House and I had a fairly significant dialogue on the radio. He was asking some very pointed questions specifically because he didn't want to pull us out of there if we didn't need to be. He just needed to know what was going on in the roof. So uh, I actually got down at one point, went inside, rechecked the structural members inside. There was some, some charring and some alligatoring on some of the web pieces um, of, the, of the truss system, but it was grossly intact. And the one area that we were seeing some collapse was in that, that kind of middle aspect of the house running from Alpha to Charlie. So we made a plan to basically isolate and, hey, we're not going past these lines. We're going to let that center section fall out and we're going to shut down the front door for access so that we don't run into what's going on underneath. The communication between, I would say, Command, Truck 23 and Rescue 21 uh, was very, very smooth and clean on this particular incident. There were times where Captain Gifford and myself were talking um, and there were also times where we were talking for one another back to Command, giving him the feedback that he was looking for because we were either one of us was happened to be task saturated at the moment or in the middle of a task. And then I think the other piece was having the uh, non-concentric uh, construction, having the house be built one way and then having that garage and apartment be built another way. They're similar from the outside, but the reality is, is that the structure underneath was very different. We ran into other obstacles with that. And I really appreciate the way that command got together with the crews and said, hey, let's, let's talk about this. What do you guys think? How are we gonna deal with this? Yeah, the second story of the garage actually presented quite the challenge. Uh, it was actually, a, a, if we're calling it a two-story garage, it was a, a master bedroom suite with, over essentially a detached garage that was connected to the main body of fire, our main body of the home, just by a covered breezeway. So essentially a standalone two-story garage with an apartment above it, a single large studio apartment. Um, the pitch on that was like a 10, or 12, 10 and 12. It was something pretty steep, all cow pack. And again, heavy fire there. So once the garage was kind of salvaged and there was a high value old vehicle in there that was protected, um, then it became a burden as to how we're gonna overhaul it. And we put our heads together and kind of came up with some unorthodox solutions. Uh, early on, options were ladder. There was not access for aerials. There was not access uh, for roof ladders. At that point, all the material had been burning for far too long. Burn time was, was, had exceeded the safety factor of getting on top of it. It's great to see guys want to be aggressive and move forward and do work. That's what I want from firemen is I want firemen and officers to be looking at how are we going to tackle this situation? How are we going to 
stop it from getting worse and maybe make it better. Um, it's a hard thing to come to the realization that there's not a good way to do this. Making intelligent decisions about we, we can't safely make this better if we, if we salvage everything out, if it gets worse, it's not gonna get worse for the people who live there or for us because we've saved all their stuff. This is a teardown anyway. Why are we gonna do something that's risky um, when we're not gonna see a good return on it? So I think that it was probably one of the, one of the best risk analysis moves that I've seen personally on the fire ground in the past several years was we can get this. Yeah, sure we can. But what do we do if we do? Does it, is, it really, is it really a win? We go up there and we peel all of this roof off. What did we win from this, right? We put guys in harm's way. God forbid something happens and a guy loses his life or ends his career to overhaul a roof. Like that just doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think that that an understanding of that construction, an understanding of the tactics involved because of that construction um, was, was a whole nother level of like tactical consideration that was made. This was a bunch of firefighters that were really professional tacticians that understood their job very well. And it demonstrated on their choice of deployments, their actions, um, being aggressive, but also being, and, and I don't want to marginalize this, but you guys probably understand how I use the word safety, not over safe, but safe in a faction that, yeah, this, we're going to write off this second floor garage, but protect the rest of the structure. Um, so, so it was that combination attack that was, that was successful. It was articulated very well. There was, there was a lot of radio traffic. I think one, at one point in the radio traffic, I even say, okay, I'm going to shut up now and let you guys just work for a little bit. Uh, cause we were kind of at a, at a midpoint of the call, but I was able to do that because I was very comfortable with asking some pinpointed questions of crews that I got very professional, engaged, um, responses back that I think is not typical sometimes on our calls. Although we did have burn time in the main living quarters, and once we had a primary and secondary, we weren't in life priority anymore. So we shifted, but the truck operations were witnessed as being very successful, even though there was some burn time on it. And I, I asked specifically from both of the truck officers, the one Captain Montgomery on the roof and Captain Gifford from the inside, I asked some pinpointed question on condition of the top and bottom cord to add some comfort comfortability levels for me to allow those crews to stay engaged in their operation. And the level of trust by doing that was extremely high at that point. They were able to articulate back my needs in the command post to um, allow their actions to continue. And that overwhelmingly was the success of the entire operation. We talk about really the, the mechanism, what our job is often. And um, our job includes saving lives and property. And to do that with a high degree of risk, but a high degree of safety and accountability in mind. And we had all those factors on this call, which made it very successful and quantified at the end by looking at um, the valuables that gave this family a huge degree of peace of mind of going through a traumatic experience. The guys were so engaged on this call. I mean, they literally owned this from, from top to bottom. But we used the opportunity when we, when we pulled everything out of the garage, the cars, got, got really kind of their life back for the weekend because they were thinking, you know, the trauma hadn't set in for this family yet. They were thinking, we got all these my girls are in softball, they're in tournaments. We, we got to save their softball uniforms and stuff. You know, the son is worried about, hey, I got all my Nintendo games. You saved everything that I wanted saved. You guys rock. But the other thing I noticed, which was different on this fire than, than other ones, in the middle of the amount of people in this, you know, older Fair Oaks neighborhood, semi-custom homes, families, the whole, the whole block of people were out there witnessing our actions from start to finish. When we took the time, and we had some other neighbors, you know, concerned about ember forecasting, we sent crews over there to check their houses out and 
you know, talk to them also. It wasn't over just go check this out. No, stop and talk to them. But the other thing that I noticed that I hadn't noticed on any other fire in a long time is we did a whole bunch of kid public education stuff. Because as we're allowing this garage, and, and I hope everybody can picture this, this wasn't flaming, shooting things off into the ember forecast. We had hose lines shooting up into the trees, you know, and keeping it in check, and we, we kept it misted on the top. So this was a slow burn. But the engineer at one point said, hey, we got all these kids lined up. Anybody, you know, want to spray some water? So we're taking the opportunity during this, as we're still engaged in this operation, protecting the rest of their stuff, sending the family through to get what they needed out of the house, putting smiles on the kids, the homeowner's kids' uh, faces. But the neighbor kids are now getting uh, a chance to spray the booster reel out on the front lawn of this place with pictures of the fire in the background. I'm not sure I've ever witnessed that before on the fire ground. And maybe that's a little, you know, out there on, on a, a atypical thing of what we should do. But the success and the compliments when I drove over the next day from the neighbors, man, you guys are a class act. You guys did it right from start to finish. Thank you for saving all their property. You know, the reward for me at this point in my career, it was like, man, this is the pinnacle. Shit, I might as well retire tomorrow. I'm not sure we're going to beat this fire. I can't, I can't find an area of improvement on this fire. It was literally, um, you know, and we can micro, we could, we could armchair quarterback and I'm sure there's gonna be something we could find, but the reality is this, this went well from A to Z, from the actions of everybody on the fire ground, everybody on the fire ground.